Title, Carried by the Wind Written by Arya When you're not careful, you slip. Not physically though, that would be a welcome change. You slip from a normal though sickly girl to a former goddess chained down to her bed. There is a very clear distinction between the two, which doesn't seem all that obvious when you first think about it. But it's crucial to who you are. Are you a goddess masquerading as a human in her second life? Or are you a human with memories of a former life traveling across the vat? You don't even know yourself most days. The sunlight strained against your curtains and with a sigh, you crawled out of bed to pry them open. The full force of its light came striking against your face and you squinted against its brightness as you made your way back into bed. But then you stopped and turned back towards the window, thinking of memories of the past. Was Morax fine? Was Barbados getting along alright? You were hardly qualified to be talking to them now in a separate body, and if you were indeed a human with memories of another life, you had no right to speak to people you never knew. You had two brothers now, a merchant and a knight of Avonius, both of whom insisted their job was to make money and your job was to stay alive. They were both caring in their own way, and sometimes you felt guilty they worked so hard just so you could relax all day and eat good food. But on the other hand, your parents had died very young and your brothers had never really gotten along. You were the metaphorical glue that kept them together, and you worried that once you died, they would fall apart. You thought of a nearby future, one where even the best medicine money could buy wouldn't save you. You knew, of course, how ephemeral human lives were. They would be devastated, and what a waste of their salary thus far that would be. But what could you even say to them, that you had already died once so you didn't fear a second time? The sun looks nice, you said instead, and resolved yourself to taking a walk outside. No sense in mopping after all while the sun was still out. You were not foolhardy enough to believe you could walk anywhere outside at night without succumbing to a cold again. You dressed slowly, giving yourself plenty of time. You needed enough layers to keep warm, but not enough to overheat and pass out in front of one of the restaurants. Your clumsy fingers, which had never worked a day in this life, finally buttoned every button and draped every bit of warm fabric of your shoulders before you pulled on your shoes with the same slug-like speed and wandered out the door. You could probably catch your second brother patrolling if you walk around enough, but then you'd be overexerted and have the same likelihood of passing out in front of the general store. The sun was not as oppressive as you thought, but it still burned steadily into the back of your head. Oh, taking a walk? One of the store owners called, smiling cheerfully at you. Everyone knew you. The sickly girl with two overprotective brothers who thought she was too weak to even eat by herself. Be careful, you don't want to push yourself. He pushed a handful of berries wrapped in parchment towards you, even as you shook your head. Go ahead. Don't worry. I only have the best. Gotta keep your energy up, right? You finally accepted his little gift and continue on your way, strolling down the street while greeting everyone. The same thing continued. One passed you some fresh loaves of bread, another gave you fresh eggs from her chickens, and yet another gave you a basket seeing how you tried to juggle everything in your hands with limited success. Popular as ever, aren't you? She asked playfully, fussing over your clothes as you hefted the basket in your arms. Don't spend too long in the sun though, make sure you take a seat in the shade sometime. They were all this careful, of course, because you had indeed collapsed on multiple occasions in town. And what a change that was. Going from an archon who drank as she pleased and wandered with little regard for her health to someone even the breeze could knock over on a windy day. Today had less people fawning over you, and you soon find out why. You wandered through the city on shaky legs until you reached the center where everyone was instead crowded around some bard playing a tune. You liked bards. They were charismatic and fun. 
and they help relieve that itch to travel with their tails. Of course, you were jealous sometimes, as humans were prone to do. But you were very much aware of how silly it was to be jealous over something you had no control over. So, you let it go. Seeing such tight crowd around the board, you only hung around the back waiting to hear a snippet. The crowd hushed and nimble fingers plucked out a sweet tune, and a beautiful singing voice hovered over the heads and straight to your ears. What a familiar voice, even if the song was unfamiliar. You tried peering over the mass of people, curious to see who it was singing and caught a glimpse of green. Here he was, singing about freedom, all dressed up like a fancy little choir boy. You were Barbados, looking no worse for a word than the last time you saw him. Immediately, you settled back down on flat feet and drew further back from the crowd, feeling a little bashful. What was he? Your ex-boyfriend? Ah, embarrassing. Embarrassing, embarrassing. As you were now, you had no right to see him. A former goddess turned into a frail human, now a girl waiting to die. Thank you, thank you. You could hear him truly announce behind you as you turned away. I accept all tips, but of course, if anyone's willing to donate some wine, I would be happier. Yes, so... His taste had refined since then. Good, good. You hesitated once, turning back to see him all smiles and good faith. And then, you hesitated no more, wandering back to your house to laze around for the rest of the day. It was perhaps ill-fated of you to have met someone so important to your past life, however, because you slept shallowly that night. You dreamt of Morax, Guijang, even Barbados laughing and humming a tune just for you. He sat by your side on the grassy hills of Mondstadt and told you about his citizens, all flourishing after the Carabians' rule, and how he was in debt to you forever. Even as you told him you had long since the clear skies you sought as payment, you woke in the middle of the night, unable to sleep any longer. Thus was the curse of any immortal, burdened with enough memories to fill up lifetimes and lifetimes. You dressed yourself in at least three layers, double-checked to make sure your second brother was sound asleep, and slipped out the door. It was rare. You treated yourself to a late-night walk, too windy to bother most of the time, but it had been your favorite thing in another life. The breeze tickled your cheeks as you strolled in the empty streets, clear of the town's folk all bending over backwards to give you a little something to bring you home. Your brothers worked so hard to get on the good side of everyone, and here you were, reaping the rewards with no effort. You walked and walked until you found yourself at the foot of a familiar statue. What a magnificent monument to someone you didn't have the right to see. You were ready to head back to try to get more sleep when you made out a familiar tune. Echoing from somewhere above your head, you peered up to see the same bard from earlier. Your dearest Barbados plucking out his melodies. Well, it wasn't like he'd recognize you, so you closed your eyes and listened to his lonely song. Though the more you listened, the more it sounded sorrowful in the most striking way, as if you had heard it once before. Oh, that one. It hit you in the next moment, thinking of your death by that great big tree in Liwe, Morax. Was he still doing well? Perhaps Barbados had kept his promise, visiting and driving away the loneliness at bay. The rest, then, Morax could tackle on his own. He was not so weak that you worried for him so seriously, but in the way friends often did for one another. It was a tune like no other he played, evocative but awfully quiet, meant for two people in the world, and one was dead. So good luck with that, as your human companions often said. Still, you had hung around and leaned against the statue once your feet grew tired. A little blasphemy with your background was probably fine. You wanted to hear the rest of it. You had died halfway through, and wasn't that a shame? Missing the love of your life's heartfelt song, you listened to him finish plucking out those last notes, 
and just as he stepped away from the statue, he came jumping down with a sort of recklessness you might have attempted. Had your body not been born so weak, even the thought of it made your joints ache. How was it? He asked with a wink. Uh, how are you still alive? You ask instead, even though you already knew why. Oh, <laughs> I have a vision. He waved off your very natural concern, drawing your eye to his little glass vision hanging off his hip. Fake, obviously. You are an archon. What do you need a vision for? More importantly, what did you think? It's rare I see someone out this late. Just a little trouble sleeping, you told him. But your song was quite nice. I might have hired you to play lullabies for me in the future. You meant that as a complete joke because though it didn't show you were quite looking forward to escaping the one person who could send your hopes of living a quiet life up in smoke, instead, he looked rather pleased. Then I'll be counting on you for my employment. I prefer it in wine. Perhaps you might consider the up-and-coming Don Winery's collection. I hear they've got a knack for it. See, maybe reincarnating wasn't such a good thing. The man you had respected a great deal was now trying to fleece down a poor sickly girl. <laughs> but wine isn't exactly cheap. I may as well help myself to sleep at this rate. Uh, then how about some apples? Freshly picked just from the outskirts of the city would be fine. And why was he trying so hard to hassle a girl on her deathbed? Barbados, Barbados, how far the mighty could have fallen after you died and left him unaccompanied. Unfortunately, if I tried to leave the city, I'd be arrested on the spot. It was a true story. Once, you had gotten it into your head to go check out the dandelions just outside the city gates. Who would have thought your brother had recruited every knight of Avonius to make sure you couldn't escape? What a stifling love. You smile at the thought, momentarily distracted from your godly pursuer. He only watched you with the same unmoving smile, eyes curved sweetly. I'm a bit weak, you explained to him, having come back from your trip down memory lane. Too weak to step outside the city, according to some. Uh, that's quite disappointing. Are you interested in traveling? <sighs> come now. What was this? Interrogate the sickly girl in hopes of finding your dead Archon somewhat lover? <laughs> in his dreams. Doesn't everyone who's stuck in the same city? You smiled again, shaking your head slowly. But no, I'm contented at this point. Nothing left to do but lie down and die, I suppose. His smile halted a moment. Right. You had done exactly that to him. Still, why was he getting so pressed over it? You were the one that died in such a way, not him. Isn't it better to fight on? He asked instead, and you wondered just why he was fixated on some random girl on the street. Tell you what, I'll go pick you some apples and play you a lullaby. You would rather he leave and carry with him the memory of Poyan. Up in the way, so you could live on in peace and pretend that that period of your life never happened. That's sweet of you. Why the fixation on me though? He looked at you. Not the Archon, but you. The you of the present. You were no longer her either. Unable to wander, chained to one place. Perhaps the greatest fear of the Archon you ever had back then. You remind me of my friend, he said. With honesty, he didn't think someone he just met could get out of him. She could never stay in one place too long. And yet we have only just met, he told him, but appreciated the sentiment. But thank you. I'll keep your offer in mind. I should head back now, however, so I'll leave it to Barbados if we meet again. I'll leave it to you, was what you meant, but perhaps he wouldn't recognize your true meaning. And then you absconded, mind filled with each and every memory of him, up until you fell asleep and dreamt of all the places you had visited a very, very long time ago. 
Ah, that damn Barbados. Making you feel the one for adventuring once more when you had buried that desire and packed it tightly with dirt. You caught a call the next day and with great fear for your life, your brothers forbade you from heading out to the upcoming Windbloom Festival as you slowly recovered. So you waited around in your room, looking out the window. From above, you peered at the many people below lazily, before your eyes turned to the decorations strewn across the buildings. You hadn't noticed the person calling for you at first, until his voice grew a little higher in pitch and you looked down to see Barbados again, waving at you with a bunch of apple held in his free arm. You could only smile wirely before directing him towards the door and making your way down the stairs to let him in. He dropped off most of the apples at the kitchen table before following you up to your room with just one and the knife he sneakily pilfered from your kitchen. He sat beside you on the bed, casually peeling his apple with practice movement. You had always eaten it with a peel. Why the fun fear now? It's a shame you can go out to enjoy the festival. He commented, smile still stuck on his face. They've got some special alcoholic drinks just for the occasion, you know? Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to drink. Oh, how you missed it. Your current life was so chaste, so devoid of worldly joy, like climbing tall trees and going somewhere that wasn't in the city of Mondstadt. Not even one? He looked very sorry for you as he broke off a small piece of the apple, passed to you. You gladly accepted and savored the taste. Somehow, they just seemed that much better when they came from him. But that sounded horrible. I should sneak something in for you. Oh please, one shot of the strongest stuff they brewed at Don Winery might actually kill you. I'm fine as is. You wouldn't want to deal with my brothers after all. He cut himself a slice of apple too, chewing thoughtfully. Isn't it lonely by yourself here? I'm used to it, you breezily replied. Back before, you often traveled long distances on your own too. But perhaps that was different because you would always find someone to talk to within the next few days. You stopped at inns filled with people and spoke with whoever caught your eye. But perhaps to Barbados, Boyan was always surrounding herself with others. And what about you? Isn't it boring waiting here with me? Not at all, he was quick to reply with. Though I hear the wind room star is about to choose a flower. I'm curious to hear what you think is the wind room. You thought about it. It wasn't a hard decision, really. Cecilia's. You knew what the wind bloom truly represented. And since there wasn't a true one, it simply ended up being whichever you associated with Barbados. Cecilia's, in this case, he loved them. You did too. Interesting decision. Not without its loyal followers, too. He looked towards the window, cutting off another piece of apple for you. If you become the Windbloom star next year, you should present that. <laughs> that would be too much excitement for me. And then all the excitement would get to your head and then you'd drop dead or the like. But if you end up as a Windbloom star and there's nothing you have in mind, why don't you pick up the Cecilia for me? I'll consider it. You smile at one another. One god and one human. Both connected beyond death. And perhaps that was the last peaceful moment you had with him in this life. You had always known you'd die early. Perhaps it was the god in you which predicted it from a mile away. Perhaps it was simply having grown up in that body, weak beyond measure. You lay around your brothers, all pleading with the doctors they dragged into your room just to bother you with. It's not a big deal, you told them, dramatically coughing blood into your hand. It is a big deal. How am I going to live without you? They were both certainly dramatic about such a normal part of mortal life. You let them cry over you and comforted them each. Goodness, you were the youngest of them all, but now you really had to act like the oldest. You told them pretty words and pretty lies and becoming a star or whatever, and then shoot them and their hard help out of the room. You thought that would be it. But later that night, 
the most peculiar thing happened. The Archon of Mondstadt. Good old Barbados himself managed to crawl through your windows on the second floor. Hey, he said, like he hadn't just committed a feat not accessible to normal humans. Seriously, you were dying now and had no energy to even pretend like it was unexpected. And what is the rising star of Monset doing in my room? You ask, settling deeper in your blankets. Making good in that lullaby? He replied and drew closer to your bed. Despite his best attempts, you could see how sad he was. Plenty of humans died every day. You didn't see why he was so distraught over you. He took a seat at the foot of your bed and began a familiar tune. For a moment, you nearly imagined you were back in Thiyue, fading away as dying archons often did. The meaning of this particular selection didn't escape your attention, and you almost wanted to scoff, but that would take too much energy. So you sighed instead. You knew this whole time, didn't you? And you let me make a fool of myself. Come now, Barbados. I thought we had more than that. You insisted, he said, smiling at his hands forlornly. I thought I was perfect too. What gave it away? He turned to you, hand reaching out for what you didn't know, until his eyes met yours. The soul never changed, Wyan. I can still see you. Unfortunately, I am not her now. But I suppose I never had a chance in the first place. You laughed to yourself. Something that now took effort. <laughs> I can never hide anything from you, but I didn't want you to know. She is dead after all, and I am someone else. No longer that same person you love. It doesn't matter if you've changed. Is love so rigid? He drew closer and you pat him on the head, laughing again. One that didn't sit right with your ribs. And when did you learn all these pretty words? You sighed again, trying to ease the sharp, stinging pain left over from the simple act of laughing. I do love you, though. So much more than one lifetime could contain. I'll tell you what. If I make it through this one and you see me in the future, I won't avoid you anymore. You smiled at him, hoping to convey everything you didn't have the time to say. It's too much trouble anyways, I swear. You fall in love with an archon once and it'll come haunting you for the rest of your lifetimes. He gingerly picked up your hand and you close your eyes thinking of the future. But I will miss you. Until we meet again, my dear Barbados.